Hello, my name is Wim Bogaerts from Ghent University and IMEC in Belgium and I would like to talk to you today about our work in the Morphic project where we are building large-scale programmable photonic circuits using silicon photonics but with a twist we're adding microelectromechanical systems or MEMS. Now why silicon photonics? Well because it's the, te the technology that allows you to do really high density photonic integrated circuits and as on top of that, do that in a CMOS electronics fabric. So the result is complex functionality at a low cost that can be fabricated at high volume. Essentially, it gives you the scale benefit of the large scale manufacturing and at the same time, the benefit for submicron waveguides that can be integrated by the thousands. So as a result, you can see in this uh, plot, these are chips that have been fabricated in the past couple of years not just by us, by everyone around the world, and you see that you see a steady increase in integration density. However, all these circuits in this graph are application-specific circuits. They're designed to do only one thing. So as just an example, if you want to make a transceiver for parallel single-mode fiber, today you take four uh, MZI modulators, put them together with four detectors on a chip, and uh, integrate them and with a fiber interface and a laser, and you have a transceiver. But if you want to upgrade your link, for instance, to coherent communication, you need to start all over again by taking the same type of building block but wiring them up in a different way. And if you want to do wavelength division multiplexing, you have to throw in some wavelength filters, but essentially you're using the same building blocks again, but wiring them up again in a different way. So this is quite uh, costly because every time you have to design a new chip, you have to design it, fabricate it, package and test, and it takes you about a year for you to discover the bugs and typically have to repeat the process again, which is quite costly and it's a killer for getting time to market. In electronics, there's a stark contrast. Because if you want to prototype something in electronics, you buy an off-the-shelf electronics chip. You program it, test it, and only if it's needed, after a couple of weeks or months, you can decide to design an ASIC. But that and by that time, using, for instance, a field programmable gateway, you can already have tried and tested your value proposition and the key functionalities. So where is the equivalent in photonics? Where are the photonic FPGAs or programmable photonic chips or photonic processors? Or to coin a definition here, where are the photonic integrated circuits that can be reconfigured in software to perform different functions? And all of these items are important. Now, such a circuit would look a bit like this, if you just start from a black box. It can take optical signals in and out, but it can also process high-speed electrical signals, radio frequency signals. If we look in a bit more detail, the optical inputs would essentially be fiber ports, but then the electrical inputs are essentially high-speed electro-optic modulators that immediately convert a high-speed electrical signal into an optical signal by modulating it into a laser carrier. And at the outputs, RF outputs, you find the opposite operation, where a modulated optical signal is converted back into an electrical signal. And in between all these ports is a programmable all-to-all -all photonic circuit. In practice, it, looks a bit, it could look a bit like this. A waveguide mesh, which consists of tunable couplers and phase shifters, essentially allowing you to program the scatter matrix between all the ports in this uh, circuit. Now, the nice thing about such a waveguide mesh, is that you only need two types of components to make it. You need an electro-optic phase shifter and you need a tunable coupler. The catch is here that you need hundreds or thousands of them. So they need to be really good, they need to be compact, they need to have low optical loss and low power consumption. Now if we think about what the workhorse is today in silicon photonics in terms of low power or low optical loss compact phase shifters, we end up with heaters and that's not a very good proposition to scale up to thousands of heaters. So, what we're doing in Morphic is look into mechanical systems. We're trying to bring in microelectromechanical MEMS systems. Now, mechanical tuning is quite effective. You have different ways to move material around in silicon, either with electrostatic or thermal or piezoelectric or magnetic effect, which essentially allows you to change the effective index of the waveguide, to change the coupling distance, to change the waveguide length, or even in cases where you use uh, mechanical bistability or latching, non-volatile states. And by bringing this together, 
by manipulating displacement, strain, and buckling, we can end up with suspended waveguides and photonic MEMS. Now, this is not a new idea. Photonic MEMS exist already for quite a long time. It's obvious the mechanical effect is quite strong. So you have already in literature quite a lot of examples of movable waveguides, uh, of waveguides with latching, uh, of, of different mechanical systems like ring resonators that can be tuned or grating couplers. There's, if we con if we consider the actuation mechanisms of silicon photonics MEMS, we can identify multi-layer and single-layer MEMS. Now the multi-layer are quite powerful because you can essentially vertically couple and you can vertically move your waveguides. So the examples by Berkeley are really quite spectacular and really large scale. However, most photonic circuit systems uh, and technologies have only a single waveguide layer at the moment. So that means that you have to resort to this kind of out of plane or in plane uh, manipulation of the, of the material to tune uh, your effective index or your coupling. Now, most MEMS demonstrations today are being demonstrated in a specific process where you have this undercut available uh, to, to show uh, or to affect your uh, movement. Now, that means that you need to change your platform in order to have these MEMS. And this undercut is usually not compatible with existing silicon photonics platforms. So that's where Morphic comes in. The Morphic project doesn't want to do just MEMS, it wants to do MEMS in an established silicon photonics platform with modulators, with photo detectors, with everything built in without affecting the performance of that platform. And so for this, we use the iMac ISIC 50G platform. Now the consortium is six groups in Europe with expertise in MEMS packaging and of course, silicon photonics processing. And the baseline from which we start is the ISIC 50G platform of iMac. Now, this already has world-class, state-of-the-art uh, performance in modulators, detectors, uh, waveguides, etc. So we start from a good baseline. Now the question is how to get these MEMS in there, because typical silicon photonics platform does, isn't just waveguides, it has metal layers to electrically connect all the electro-optic devices. So if you look at a cross-section, the ICIP 50G platform has one key feature. It has a well in the a well that can be etched in the way in the dielectric layer to access the waveguides. This is, for instance, useful for sensors. Now, in Morphic, we use this well to, with some alumina protection on the on the chip, the rest of the chip, to undercut locally the silicon photonics and essentially make freestanding waveguides. This looks a bit like this, which is very nice, but of course. It's not that easy. In the end, you're playing with hydrofluoric acid, which is quite an aggressive agent. And so what you can what you can see with these MEMS is different things can go wrong. Your MEMS uh, circuits can collapse and stick and you get stiction to, to each other or stiction to the silicon substrate. Uh, you can have a uh, attack of the, the HF, the vapor HF uh, into your buried oxide, which is uncontrolled. Uh, you can have an attack of your vapor HF into your dielectric layers on top of your silicon because, for instance, your allox protection is not uh, completely uh, uh, completely uh, hermetic, or your bond pads can be uh, cannot be completely sealed, and as a result, uh, you can also get an attack, which makes nice psychedelic pictures, but not very nice for your uh, process. So, in total, with the, with this very very aggressive process, uh, you can really trigger an apocalypse on your silicon photonics chip. So, we have this process, we get some nice results now, but there's a new challenge, because we want to combine these MEMS devices, which are outside of the oxide and freestanding, we want to combine them with the uh, devices that are already there in the silicon photonics platform. So we have to transition from oxide clad devices to air clad devices. And we need to do that both for the optical waveguides as well as for the electrical wires that connect the, or electrically connect the uh, microelectromechanical system. And we have to do all of that. We have to engineer these transitions without having any possibilities for the vapor HF to attack 
the oxide at the top or penetrate too deep from the bottom. So this is what we came up with and it works pretty well. So essentially we're using a rib waveguide where we engineer the, the widths of the rib uh, to minimize reflections and losses. And we use an allox protection that nicely covers this uh, rib waveguide. Now this is how it looks like from the top. So you can clearly see the undercut region and you can see the rib waveguide. You can see the edge of the allox protection. You can also see the in white on the right side, the wall of your oxide. This is an optical picture which allows you to look through the oxide and see indeed that you see the rib waveguide uh, penetrating from the air clad to the oxide clad. Now the losses of this transition are, are quite good. We're talking about 0 0.05 dB per transit. Of course, if you need thousands of transits, that still amounts to a sizable loss. But we're further engineering this transition uh, to get even lower losses. We also need a transition for the electrical uh, wires. So here we use an electrical insulation trench, which we keep as narrow as possible, again, to avoid a penetration of the vapor HF into the, buried, uh, into the back end oxide. And then we use doped silicon to minimize the resistance. So this way we avoid the use of metals near the MEMS. This is a picture of the waveguide. So you can see that you have on the bottom right here uh, a rip waveguide um, where we make sure that the, the entire waveguide, the entire optical path inside the, the MEMS environment is fully undercut. So you get no transitions or no discontinuities where the light has to, uh, where the light sees an undercut or a non-undercut waveguide, only when it has to transition through the wall. Also, we have transitions between rip and strip waveguides. So the strip waveguides are, can not be easily supported. So we need to design the suspensions very carefully and we need to provide anchors for the strip waveguides to, uh, to make sure they're safely attached. Also, because the silicon layer is always a little bit strained, you have to include strain relief into your optical design as well. So in this example, you see at the bottom, you see kind of ski sticking out, which is essentially a, a, a thin beam of silicon that we can use to tune the locally refractive index. So this way we can make it a phase shifter. Essentially, we have the waveguide core and a, a silicon beam where we can change the distance of the silicon beam to the waveguide. And this gives you a pretty efficient phase shifter. So depending on the distance of the silicon with the extra beam, uh, you get a strong effect and, and you can keep the gaps quite small. So by moving this either vertically or horizontally. So this is a picture where we actuate this beam horizontally using a comb drive. Uh, that gives a nice phase shifter. So where we can, uh, with a 20 volt actuation, we can get nicely a pi phase shift um, from this design. And this is for three different uh, designed gap widths or three different well, combinations of waveguide width and gap width. So if you make your waveguide narrower, obviously you get more of your light outside of your waveguide core. So we expect the effect to be stronger and indeed we see that. So we get for a 350 nanometer wide waveguide, we get more than two pi phase shift for 20 volts. On the other hand, if we push light more out of the waveguide, it's more disturbed by the phase shifter. And we also see indeed that this has much higher insertion losses. So while for the, the, the wider waveguides, we see a 0.2 uh, dB insertion loss, for the narrow waveguide, uh, we get multiple dBs insertion loss. So it's a trade-off between efficiency and insertion loss here, and which can further be optimized. We can also use the same technique to do coupling. So you can essentially do a directional coupler design with freestanding and you can engineer it to be broadband. Uh, so in this example uh, here, you see uh, in on and off state that you get, uh, or that you get quite a good suppression and over a wide uh, bandwidth. And you can also actuate it. So you can either do it with a virtual actuator, pull the coupler down, or you can move it in plane uh, to uh, change the coupling distance. You can cascade these couplers, so for instance, to get a higher extinction ratio. But of course, this is only useful for certain functions. So for instance, in this case, it would be a one by two optical switch. 
This is another example of an optical switch, which is even more compact than the use of directional couplers. It's essentially a simple waveguide tip that can be moved electrostatically to connect to either one output waveguide or another. And this looks like deceptively simple. It takes quite a bit of design to, to, to make it work because you need mechanical stoppers, you need electro design to be sufficiently controlled that you don't have strong pull-in, uh, and you need to design the optical tapers that they have minimal uh, transition loss. But the result works quite well. So it needs to be controlled with two voltages to pull in either one direction or the other. But you see that you can get like 25 dB extinction ratio in your switching uh, in, the, in either one of the input and output states. Th these losses are fiber to fiber, so the grating couplers have not been normalized out here. So if you have your MEMS, they're of course freestanding, so these are nice designs. But in practice, you would want to make them hermetically sealed so that they're protected from, uh, from the environment and they don't get damaged mechanically. So as part of the project, we're adding wafer-bonded silicon lids, which make it possible to, see, uh, to seal in your MEMS inside the cavity. Now these are some examples with, uh, without optical components. So at this point, we don't have uh, this, uh, sealed devices yet with optical components. But the tests show that the, the, the yield after two months of cycling is pretty high. So you get, you get really like high sealing yield uh, using this aluminum uh, bond pads. So as a result, what we're doing in Morphic now is take the iMIC IC50G process and add an entire layer of MEMS building blocks, so, which allows us then to make circuits. Because in the end, what we wanted to do is build programmable circuits. So this is an example of a circuit where we have every building block in its own cavity. So all the MEMS are essentially connected with waveguides and they're also electrically connected to the bond pads and to the metal wiring in the silicon photonics chip. Now that's not very practical if you want to reduce the losses. So if we want to eliminate the transition losses, we have to bring as much of the MEMS components together into one cavity, so to minimize the transits. And so we, we've built an entire design kit that allows us to construct these circuits together with the silicon photonics design uh, inside a single cavity. So now we have tunable couplers, we have phase shifters, and we can start building waveguide meshes. And this is an example of uh, one of the one unit cell of a waveguide mesh. So we, we see here three phase shifters and three, uh, three couplers together. Let's zoom in on this a bit more so you can see three phase shifters and three tunable couplers. Now you see that this design can be quite compact and we could probably stack it even closer together and optimize the, the, the size of these uh, building blocks. But still there's a lot of empty space in between. So what is limiting the integration density here? Well it's the electrical connections. We need bond pads to actuate every single MEMS device and this little sub-circuit requires at least on its own seven bond pads, not counting the monitor photodetectors. So if we want to make large-scale circuits, it, will, it means that we have to uh, integrate a lot of electronic bond pads. And this is what the morphic design looks like for these bond pads. Is we, we, separate, we split up the whole chip layout, and this is a full field reticle, like two and a half by two and a half centimeter, uh, we split it up into unit cells of about one and a half by one millimeter. And each of those has 16 bond pads. So that's essentially limiting the integration density here, is that you need these bond pads to connect to the electronics. Now to do this, rather than at this point developing a, an ASIC driver, we're working with off-the-shelf driver electronics, which we connect using a ceramic interposer, and it's a quite complicated interposer because it has to transmit 3,000 bond pads out. We use a ceramic interposer and off-the-shelf electronics to connect everything together. So this essentially brings together an entire technology stack. We have our photonic chip, we have electronics, in this case off-the-shelf electronics, and software. On top of that, we have to, this gives us a new way to design functionality. Rather than now designing a full custom geometry for your photonics chip, or even designing a custom circuit based on building blocks, we can now take a programmable mesh and design the connectivity inside the mesh. Essentially, by 
cho choosing the state of every coupler and then routing light. So you can, for instance, use this for routing uh, light through the mesh in different directions. You can even do multiple routes of light at the same time. And the nice thing is that you can even have two routes running through the same coupler. And now the fact that everything is coupled together is actually a convenience because one of the key problems in photonic circuits, namely the crossing of waveguides, is totally not a problem in such a programmable mesh because you can just switch one of the couplers from bar state to cross state and now you have a built-in crossing. You can use partial coupling to do splitters. Uh, you can even combine light again, which essentially gives you an interferometer, so you can introduce delay lines to make an optical filter. You can even loop the light around in rings to make uh, ring resonators, which uh, is, is kind of interesting to make high quality filters. And this allows you essentially to construct any circuit on a chip. So if we go back to our example of programmable transceivers, we can program our PSM4 transceiver like this in such a mesh, essentially assigning the eight modulators uh, as Maxander modulators and connecting the output fibers to photodetectors. But we can reprogram this to connect the modulators as an IQ modulator and to do a 90 degree hybrid for uh, coherent receivers. Or we can even use this mesh to, using the ring resonators and maxenders in such a mesh to make filters and do a WDM4 uh, with four wavelength channels. And you can do more things. It's not just good for transceivers. So in Morphic, we're also uh, building a 16 by 16 switch matrix out of uh, such a programmable circuit. We're using, microwave, uh, we're using it for beam forming, uh, where we have a beam forming network for optical beam steering or for microwave photonics processing, where you use uh, the optical filters to actually filter uh, your microwave signals. And these can be used in quite a lot of applications. For instance, you could use them for uh, fiber to the home transceivers. Uh, you can even use the RF, the high-speed electronics capabilities, to modulate XDSL on top of fiber. Uh, you can use it to, uh, for radio over fiber for 5G applications. You can also use it as a sensor readout system, for instance, for fiber brag rating sensors in buildings. Uh, you can use it for a sensor hub in, uh, in automotive applications, using uh, reading out multiple optical sensors throughout uh, the car. Uh, the, similar, the same system can also be formed the basis of a, a LiDAR, optical beam forming scanner. Uh, not necessarily exactly in this generic programmable form, but the technologies can be the same. Or you can use it for radars, for microwave radars, for drones. Also for sensors in biomedical applications, uh, like blood analysis or uh, OCT, optical coherence tomography, uh, for the eye or the skin or, or the or teeth. Or in security applications, you can use it for optical hashing, optical proof of work, uh, quantum key distribution, things like that. So these programmable photonics chip can be used a lot in a lot of applications. The important part is that they essentially uh, require only one chip to do everything. Now, is that really true? Do you, can you just do one chip? Well, it's the same trade-off as in electronics. Such a large chip could be expensive. It could accumulate quite a lot of loss and a lot of power consumption. The key advantage of programmable photonics is that it shortens your supply chain. Rather than having to wait six months for your chip, you can now essentially uh, reduce the lead time for a new chip in a couple of days and then program everything in it. And only if needed, just like in electronics, you design an ASIC afterwards. So the idea of programmable photonics is to make chips smarter and to make them definable in software. So it can be a game changer in our opinion, because it allows you to really shorten your supply chain and to make fast prototyping possible for photonic chips. Now, in Morphic, we try to build the entire technology stack for this, with the key, uh, key extra ingredient of using microelectromechanical systems. So essentially, we're starting from a wafer scale platform all the way to, a micro, uh, to a, a demonstrators. So I'd like to take any questions. Feel free to ask.